thank you, Susan and John and Ryan and Neely and Alicia and Brad and Leo and Rachel and all and Ann and all who are participating in this service. What a gift, what a blessing it is uh, to worship God together, to offer our, our gifts to the Lord. Uh, the blessing song that Susan just sang and then the song about the traveling stranger that Ryan and Neely and Alicia, Traveler Unknown, and John did and will do uh, as the conclusion of the service all speak to um, this amazing episode in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 20, uh, excuse me, 32 verses 22 through 31. Uh, where Jacob wrestles with God. We'll explore this amazing, amazing episode in our sermon today. Hear the word of God. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, for the blessings that come through raindrops for the ways in which you shape our character and deepen our trust in you amid the trials of this life, we are grateful. For the traveler unknown who comes to Jacob and who eventually is revealed to him as you, we give you thanks and we pray that you would help us to learn, speak to us what you would say to us today through this experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I no longer wrestle with our three teenage boys. It would be physically dangerous for me to do so and also a threat to my own personal dignity. But there was a time when our boys were younger and much smaller and I was still a lot bigger than them when we would wrestle. It's a lot of fun. There's just something about uh, parents, mothers and fathers wrestling with their daughters and their sons when they're little. They're, as, as long as things don't get out of hand, as, as long as all involved are careful, as long as no hair is pulled, um, then it's just this amazing, amazing thing. But in order for it to work, in order for this uh, wrestling match between parents and young children to work, it requires some very special, significant things for the parents to do. The parents must not act on their larger physical strength. They, they have to put that physical strength aside. The parents have to get on the level of the child in, in order for the, the parents have to give their daughters and sons some level of equality in the wrestling match for it to, to be what it's supposed to be. And when a child, a son or daughter, grabs a hold of her or his father or mother, the parent needs to let them hang on for as long as they want to and not break away. This passage, in one sense, is about Jacob. It's about his determination to hold on. It's about his strength. It's about his uh, audacity. And we'll talk about that in a moment, about how this passage invites us to imitate Jacob. 
But much more than Jacob, this passage is about God. For like a father or mother who puts aside their overwhelming physical strength in comparison to what their children have in order to join them in wrestling, Almighty God, the creator of all that that is, the one who holds all power and sustains all things, the source of life, God gets down on Jacob's level. God becomes vulnerable to Jacob. There is this voluntary physical equality that God enters into in this wrestling match. And when and when Jacob holds on and will not let go, God does not burst his grip, Jacob's grip, but only says, the sun is coming, let me go. Now, God is mysterious for sure in this passage. Uh, Verse uh, 24 simply says, uh, a man wrestled with him. Throughout the passage, it's the the person, the the wrestler is referred to as the man. And, And when Jacob asks the man his name, the man will not answer the question. And, and we only know that this is God through this mysterious utterance that the man makes uh, in, in verse uh, 28. And he says of Jacob, you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. And then it's only after the episode that Jacob has clarity over who he's been wrestling with through the night when he says in verse 30, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life is preserved. It's a mystery. It's amazing. It's not something that we can fully comprehend. The text doesn't tell us exactly how this works. We only know that God in this moment chooses to be vulnerable to come down on Jacob's level and to wrestle with him. Notice that it's God who initiates the wrestling. Verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. There's no indication that Jacob is expecting this wrestling match. Jacob does not go looking for God. God goes looking for Jacob. And so we have some very important questions to wrestle with. Why is it that God chooses to come to Jacob in the form of this mysterious man and to wrestle with him? Why is it that God initiates the wrestling match with Jacob? The context gives us our answer. Remember that uh, Jacob had stolen his, the birthright of his older brother Esau. Remember in ancient days, it was the oldest son who received the blessing of the father and then carried on the family tradition, was in charge of the family when the father was gone. But Jacob, the younger brother, tricks his father, tricks their father, receives the blessing, and things do not go well between him and Esau. Esau is not happy about it. Jacob goes away for a long time. Scripture tells that story in detail. And then God calls him home. And as Jacob obeys that call and brings his families and all of his livestock back home, he is is anxious. He is afraid because he knows he must face his brother Esau. Has Esau been stewing in anger all of these years? Has Esau been plotting his revenge all of this time? So earlier in the chapter, earlier in chapter 32, verse 11, Jacob prays to God, Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all. Then Jacob gives instructions to his servants, all of the wealth in livestock that Jacob has accumulated in his time away. He takes a large, a large portion of that of goats and camels and colts, and and he has his servants send those ahead of him to Esau, kind of like a peace offering. And he says this, Jacob says this in chapter 32, verse 20, for Jacob thought, I may appease him, my brother, with the presents that go ahead of me, and afterwards I shall see his face, perhaps he will, perhaps he will accept me. 
That's the state of Jacob's emotional, uh, his emotions and his spiritual uh, reality in that moment as he waits alone by the river that night. And then the man comes and wrestles with him. And we discover that it's God. And through that wrestling, Jacob finds courage. He's not as afraid. And as soon as daybreak comes, as soon as the, as the man leaves him, chapter 33 tells us that Esau approaches from a distance. And after wrestling with God throughout the night, here's how Jacob is changed. Here's how he responds when he sees his brother. Chapter 33, verse 3. Jacob goes out ahead of his family, the text says, bowing himself to the ground seven times, posture of humility, until he came near his brother. And then, there's, then verse 4, the wonderful good news, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him. God wrestles Jacob through the night, God comes down to Jacob's level, gets vulnerable with Jacob, allows Jacob to hold on so that Jacob will be prepared to meet Esau. God doesn't appear to Jacob in a dream and speak words of courage and comfort. He doesn't appear in a dream and say, be not afraid. God doesn't send an angel to, to Jacob and say, as the angels often do, be not afraid. Instead, God wants Jacob to participate in his own development of courage. God wants Jacob to participate in the giving and the receiving of the gift that Jacob needs to be faithful as he, as he sees his brother once more. The wrestling is about preparation. It's about Jacob's participation in what God is doing in his life. Now, you and I, we don't uh, physically wrestle God. This is a one-time thing, and it's part of salvation history. It's through this event, not only that Jacob's courage and his faith and his trust grows, but it's through this event that Jacob gets a new name, Israel. This is part of that long salvation story through which Israel is formed and becomes God's people and out of which eventually, out of whom eventually comes Jesus. That's why there's this physical appearance of God, mysterious as it is. So we don't wrestle God physically the way Jacob does in this passage. But we do wrestle with God. We wrestle with God in prayer. Uh, the NIV and the NRSV translations of Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. In, those, in, in that verse, Paul actually says, he speaks of a person named Epaphras who wrestles with God in prayer. And we wrestle with God through our seeking to understand the scriptures by pouring over the scriptures, reading them, discussing them, wrestling with them. We wrestle with God as we think through our faith, as we think through our doubts, as we try to understand the impossible, the incomprehensible who is the one who created us. We wrestle with God and with each other, with trusted sisters and brothers as we try to understand how to live faithfully in this life and as we try to live faithfully in the midst of our own specific circumstances. We know how to wrestle with God. And the good news from this passage of Jacob's wrestling is that God welcomes our wrestling. It's not just that we're allowed to wrestle with God. We're encouraged to do so. God is not offended if we try to hold on and cling and wrestle. God welcomes it. And it is through the wrestling with our Lord that we participate in our own spiritual growth. God is preparing us as we wrestle with our doubts, as we wrestle with uncertainty, as we wrestle with what to do in times of decision, as we wrestle with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so Jacob inspires us in this passage. Jacob inspires us to hold on and not let go, to say to God as Jacob says to the man, I will not let you go unless you bless me. 
Seven years ago, my older cousin, older by three years, had the privilege, he and I had the privilege of preaching for our grandmother's funeral. Mama lived to be 93 years old. And uh, it was this wonderful privilege and also wonderful Holy Spirit moment for my cousin and I because he lives in Canada with his family. He's a pastor and missionary. And through, the, uh, through all of the stuff they had to do and we had to do to get to Danville, Virginia for the funeral, we never had a time to compare notes about our sermons. And, and it was this beautiful moment when we both preached the exact same sermon. We, we preached the same sermon about our grandmother from different perspectives, from our own perspectives. We both preached about how strong she was, how physically and morally and spiritually strong she was. Uh, our favorite story, it was scary at the time, but it'll, it'll live forever in our family lore. Uh, there was this dangerous moment later in their lives when our grandfather was still alive, when a man jumped out of the bushes in their neighborhood and tried to rob our grandfather. And our grandmother took her purse and just wailed on this robber and beat him and beat him and beat him with her pocketbook until he ran away. You just didn't mess with mama. And she had this moral and spiritual strength of a deep trust in God. A trust and a faith that was so deep that my cousin said in his part of the sermon that when he got the call that mama had died, he refused to believe it. He just felt like mama was going to keep saying to God, it's not time for me to go, and God was going to listen to her. She just had that Jacob-like, tenacious faith and trust. And so I want to be like my grandmother, and I want, and I, I know we want, to be like Jacob when we wrestle with God through difficulty, through trials, as Susan sang, through, through this, with, with this uh, traveling, unknown traveler, that we're hearing about. We, we want to wrestle with the God that we know in Jesus Christ, holding on in trust, in faith. And it's in the wrestling that God is at work making us more like Jesus and accomplishing wonderful things in and through us. But it's not just Jacob who wrestles with God in scripture. And it's not just Jacob or my grandmother that we want to be like. Jesus wrestled with God. Do you remember the night in which he was betrayed? Do you remember when he was in the garden? Do you remember when he prayed, wrestled with God that this cup with his father, that this cup would be removed from him? He prayed intensely, sweat like drops of blood. He prayed in, in ways like Jacob, I'm not going to let go of you until, until you bless me. But, but then he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. And we want to pray like that for ourselves. We want to, through our difficulties, through our challenges, we, we want to pray, I'm not going to let go until you bless me, but we're also praying, not my will, but thy will be done. And in that moment, we experience the presence of God in powerful ways and our trust grows and we are prepared to face whatever difficult circumstances that lie ahead. Jesus wrestled with God. And then there's that example, that verse we talked of a moment ago from Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, where Paul speaks of Epaphras. Epaphras was the one who planted, founded the church in Colossae. And as Paul is writing his letter to the Colossian Christians, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, he says this, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf so that you may stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. It is good and it is right to wrestle like Jacob, Jacob wrestling for himself with God as God prepares him to meet his brother Esau. And we not only wrestle with God for ourselves, we wrestle with God for others. 
for our family members, for our sisters and brothers in Christ, for our hurting world, for our neighbors. We wrestle, we hold on to God, we ask God to bless those around us. Specifically, Epaphras prays that the Colossians will be uh, fully mature, fully assured in everything that God wills. We wrestle with God for others in this way. And God hears our prayers and responds to our prayers. And just as in the wrestling, God was preparing Jacob to meet Esau. In our wrestling with God in prayer for others, we are being prepared to be the blessing for them. And so if we as a church want to be very serious about helping one another become more like Jesus, we'll wrestle in prayer for each other. And in the wrestling, God only not only acts on our prayers, but shapes us to be better participants in each other's spiritual growth. If we truly want to love one another unconditionally, as our vision statement says, then we will wrestle with God in prayer for each other. And in the wrestling, we as individuals will be transformed into people who do love their sisters and brothers unconditionally. If we want to worship God wholeheartedly, as our worship vision statement says, each Sunday morning we will wrestle in prayer with God for our congregation, for all who will participate, and in the wrestling with God for each other in prayer, we will find ourselves, when the hour comes, worshiping God with all of our hearts. If we truly want to help people meet Jesus, then we will wrestle in prayer for people who do not know Jesus yet. And in the praying, we will be participating in God's work in their lives. And God will be, through the Holy Spirit, preparing us to help them in our love meet Jesus. And if we want to truly love our hurting world and the hurting people in it all around us, we will wrestle with God in prayer for our world, for our neighbors. And God responds to the prayer itself and through the Holy Spirit shapes us, prepares us to be a people that truly love and serve and sacrifice for those around us. As we wrestle in prayer for others and for ourselves, we say with Jacob, I will not let you go until you bless me. And we also say with Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. And in the praying, we are participating with God in our own blessing and the blessing of others. And God, through the Spirit, is preparing us to do the things we're called to do and to be the people we're called to be. Sisters and brothers, it's not just that God allows us to be wrestlers. We're called to wrestle with the Lord in prayer, in Scripture, in conversation, in thought, And when we do so, when we do so, we find not only that we are blessed and that we are prepared to serve, we find that there is a deepening of trust in our hearts and in our lives. And we're able to be, better able to be, the people that God has called us and made us to be. May it be so for you, for me, for us, for our congregation. Thanks be to God. Amen.